and we are live. Um, good evening, Flagstaff. Um, good evening, lived Black experience uh, supporters, viewers, family, friends. Good evening, resident facilitator. How are you? Good evening. I'm well. How about yourself? I am present. Um, <laughs> I, I think this is probably going to be, uh, for me, I think a hot topic this evening. And um, with two of our frequent um, presenters, uh, these are our Black feminist uh, of the LBE. And so I'm always excited when they come together and um, to come and talk to us. But um, why don't you tell us why or how we got here this evening for this particular uh, topic as we're preparing to talk about crumbs from the table of joy? Absolutely. So the first thing I want to start with is the reminder that we've uh, been giving on a couple of these harder hitting or maybe more sensitive uh, for some topics is that uh, when we come, when we come with these conversations, we come with love. Uh, when we correct, we are correcting with love. When we ask for change, we ask for that change from a place of love. Um, and so what is the love that we are bringing tonight <laughs> is, is part of the question. Um, where we are coming from tonight is an ongoing conversation of the importance of having space to tell our own stories and recognize the importance and contribution of Black voice and community uh, in Flagstaff and within um, the broader narrative of the Live Black experience here and throughout the nation. Um, over the past now two years, the, the Live Black Experience Project has brought forward important conversations about the Live Black experience of Flagstaff and other places, shared from the voice and perspective of the um, until that conversation, often unheard voice of the Black community. Um, that engagement did see us recognized um, as a finalist in the 2021 Viola Awards Community Impact category. That was a celebration that happened during the first federally recognized Juneteenth celebration. Sadly, uh, what happened during the course of that evening was a lack of uh, recognition of that voice. Um, and we don't say that simply because we did not win. That is not what this is about. Uh, what we say that to is the fact that in a celebration that took place on uh, Juneteenth weekend, there was not a single uh, mention of the fact that that's what time you were celebrating in. Um, recognizing ourselves as the few, if not only, uh, Black people present at the Viola Awards, um, there was sadness in seeing that that was not recognized and that in discussions of diversity, um, there was no um, recognition of the importance of the Black voice of Flagstaff. Um, and then beyond that, despite the recognized impact of LBE within the broader community, um, the organization that did win um, came forward this year with a, a proposal to do a production of Crumbs from the Table uh, of Joy. And that was done without outreach to the Black community of Flagstaff um, and without some of the engagement which we have urgently and heartfeltly been asking from the Flagstaff community. Um, so what we are talking about tonight is really the importance of inviting Black voices to Black conversations. Um, what happens when a story that is very particular, this play is, is one that tells a very moving Black story, 
Um, but it's one that is not often told by uh, Black production companies. In fact, in the entire canon of Lynn Nottage's work, um, this is one of her earlier projects. It's one that many seem to lean into or lean upon as represent uh, representative of the Black experience. Um, but it tells a very uh, unique telling of that experience in a way that is very or needs to be approached very carefully from that Black perspective. Um, because when it's not, then part of the message of, of the play um, really gets lost. So uh, <laughs> that is where we're coming from. And uh, if I may, I will introduce our speakers for this evening who will take us through the play and then engage with us in conversation about that voice and the uh, importance of that conversation. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you all to Dr. Tria Allen, who is one of our returning uh, beloved guests on this program. She is a program manager for diverse and inclusive advising practice at the University of Arizona and a faculty member at Pima Community College. Her research covers the intersection of Black women in education, specifically higher education. She is the curator of underground re retention programs, Auntie Networks, and most recently the developer of an African American studies program at Pima Community College. Also joining us this evening is another beloved frequent guest, uh, Dr. Mary Rofe. Dr. Rofe is currently an assistant professor of ethnic studies at Stanislaw State. She completed her PhD from Temple University in applied anthropology and is a critical scholar whose teaching and research examines social inequities in education, specifically the school to prison pipeline in relation to race, class, and gender. Dr. Rofe's scholarly interests also include women of color feminisms and popular culture, and she has several years of professional experience as a K through 12 teacher coach and as a public policy advocate in the nonprofit sector. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sister Kira and Sister Bernadine. And I'm so happy to be joining everyone here again with the Live Black Experience and to be joining Sister Tria Allen and knowing that we do everything on behalf of, of ourselves and having a really a real and critical conversation and breakdown of this very short and very just very juicy. I mean, I think about all of the metaphors of food and and crumbs from the table of joy. And this is actually a very dense and very rich and very juicy play. So before we get yeah. started, I'll basically start out with kind of setting some of the context and going into uh, some of the key roles played by characters in the play. And then uh, Dr. Tria will close it out. And Dr. Tria, please feel free to add anything before we jump right in. Absolutely. No, I was you said it's a very thin, like the play is so short, but it, it puts you in the mind of Toni Morrison writing where like you, it's so dense at the same time. So if you are picking up this play and you're like, oh, this is great. It'll be great for community theater. You have already approached it wrong. I don't know if we can say that, but. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes, please do. So that's what I was thinking, like, oh, yes, absolutely. Like, that is exactly how I would describe this play. So we're going to jump in. And as uh, Sister Kara was already sharing, Lynn Nottage is actually the only woman to have been awarded with two Pulitzer Prizes um, in the history of the, you know, of the prize itself. And um, this is a play actually from 1995, which I think is very interesting. Um, and we'll uh, go on to the next slide, please. And so I want to open up with the way that Lynn Nottage opens up the play, which is with a quote from Langston Hughes. And we'll get into this a bit more in the context. So thinking about this larger context of the Great Migration, which is actually really interesting how Godfrey and Ernestine and Armenia and even Armina end up in New York to begin with. Um, but he is using this metaphor of crumbs falling from the table of joy. 
And then sometimes a bone is flung. So I could really envision this as a child, even though I was actually taught how to clean a bone. Okay. And really, and clean a chicken bone really well to the point where you eat all of the meat off, you eat all of the gristle, you eat the cartilage and even bite the ends of the bone of the, uh, the two ends of the bone so that you can suck the marrow out. And this came as a direct uh, legacy from my, you know, my childhood growing up in Arkansas in the northernmost part of the Mississippi Delta and really not leaving anything to waste. And this notion of right of not wasting anything and not even having really a bone to fling until it's been thoroughly cleaned. And I think this notion especially is so resonant um, of the last two lines. To some people, love is given to others only heaven. And what Lynn Nottage does is she takes the four lines from this poem and she builds this whole uh, world, right, of this family that is a microcosm of, cos cosm of so many cross currents within the United States, within the context of white supremacy, within the uh, white womanhood itself as a construct and as a reality, as the flower and the crown jewel of white supremacy and anti-Blackness itself. And so that's what she's really getting at. Who To whom is love given, right, in the context of this play? And to whom is heaven given or death in the context of this play? Within a critical feminist perspective of intersectionality. And when we look at the intersections of race and gender, not even of socioeconomic status, right? There wasn't really a big difference in some respects between um, for example, the hunger and the way that Gert and Aunt Lily devoured the food and even showing up on the, you know, showing up at the home of Godfrey, who was recently widowed with his two daughters in, in Brooklyn, right, of with their bags. So it's not even about socioeconomic status. Um, so it's brilliant how um, Lynn Nottage takes this, again, very dense, very rich work um, just from these four lines from Langston Hughes. Uh, next slide, please. Context is everything. So thank you very much, Sister Kara, for sharing the context. It's just very, you know, I'm disappointed. I'm not surprised. I'm quite frankly not surprised. Um, this is, you know, I'm a critical interdisciplinary ethics studies and colonizers do what colonizers do, which they keep colonizing. And that's what it is. They colonize everything. And what happened at these awards, I will just say, based on that context, is absolute co-optation. And it's it's just call it what it is. It's colonization. It's cultural colonization. And the reason it's colonization is because it erases the people who have always done this work and who we, and we will keep on doing it, regardless of the accolades or the awards or lack thereof. So in the context of the play, I think what's interesting about this play is that even though it was published in 1995, it was set in 1950s New York. And, you know, it's, it's at this really interesting point where it's after World War II and women are being pushed back out of the factories as well as people of color and primarily black people are being pushed out of the factories where they were solicited and enlisted, enlisted to work during World War II because so many uh, men were going overseas and fighting in Europe and specifically against the Germans, which is also uh, a key kind of theme in the, in the play. And so it's in this kind of concoction of the suburbs, which we know the greatest affirmative action bill that's ever uh, been put into practice and designed in the United States is the GI Bill. And the reason why this was an affirmative action bill is because Black men were systematically excluded and banned from being able to even access the GL, GI Bill because they were largely um, dishonorably discharged because of anti-Blackness, right, during, uh, during World War II. And women who served in WAC, the wax and waves and who would often, you know, sometimes they would be caught up in combat and battle. Women were systematically also excluded from the GI Bill. So this became a very massive GI Bill for white men who were coming back from World War II. And furthermore, this was further exacerbated with the, uh, this is in terms of the Veterans Administration, but then when you look at the Federal Housing uh, Administration and the construction of suburbs and banning anyone who was not white from being able to move to the suburbs and also banning uh, even Black families who actually were eligible to receive loans to either improve their current homes where they lived or to buy out of the suburbs were banned from doing both. Right. So, this, I mean, and, and really in practice, any actual 
the actual affirmative action that continues to this day in practice because of white supremacy and anti-blackness as its cornerstone is affirmative action for those classified as white, hard stop. That is what it is. And any mention of any other type of policy is really to try to redress this, but in practice, right, um, affirmative action has always been the law and the practice, right, of the land and continues to be. And But this is a very interesting period because it's not even what we associate with, you know, it's before the modern civil rights movement that really would start really you know, in the in the early 50s, and also historically knowing that it was the returning GIs, the Black GIs from World War II, who laid the groundwork for the modern civil rights movement as we know it, because of the really intensive and violent and systemic anti-Blackness that they encounter after fighting for, quote unquote, democracy overseas in Europe, and then experiencing some affirmative action when it came to interracial right marriage in that context. Um, so we meet the Crump family, the characters, um, which I think is a really interesting play on words because crumbs, crump. And I even wonder like, what was the, what was the nutty professor about? Because that family was also, you know, they were also the, the last name was crump. And I actually do. I actually had a coworker when I was working at the nonprofit in Phoenix from 2016 to 2018, whose last name was, uh, was Crump. And so they've recently arrived from Pensacola, Florida, Florida to Brooklyn, New York. And then a, additional context that's really necessary is that from about the ninth, early uh, 20th century, from 1910 to the 1970s, approximately six to seven million African Americans, descendants of American child slavery, engaged in the greatest or one of the greatest mass uh, migrations internally of anywhere in the world where these were people who were American citizens who had been for some time at this point, um, but who were subjected to extreme violence and sustained uh, Jim Crow segregation and white domestic terrorists um, weaponized by the oldest white supremacist organized hate group in, in the country, which is the Ku Klux Klan. So really the status of, of these millions of African-Americans was that of refugees within the borders of their own country, which differs from the presumed or kind of implied status of Gert, who is a woman who's immigrated from Germany and who's obviously, uh, you know, is it just completely, it seems like she's homeless and just looking for someone to latch on to on the subway when she meets Godfrey Crump. I think what's also interesting is this notion of Jim Crow segregation, that it only took place in the South, which is not true. And so it's either called up South or down North, right, in the Northeast part of the country, especially as millions of Blacks migrate out of the Deep South, where the vast majority of them lived up until this remaking of the entire landscape of the United States. And so even though Jim Crow segregation was the most intensively enforced and had the most astringent laws such as black codes. We know that Jim Crow segregation in a variety of ways was practiced all over the country, including in New York. And obviously, um, you know, we see this through the experiences of the characters um, uh, in, in, in the Crump family and also the culminating experience with um, the really violent culmination of anti-blackness and anti miscegenation or anti-mixing, which were also laws that were still on the books at this time. And you didn't really, we didn't associate that with places like New York. And yet Gert and Godfrey are subjected to a really violent attack by multiple white men because they are an interracial couple. What I also think is very interesting about what Lynn Nottage does around the Great Migration, and again, this is a lot of show, Right. She doesn't go into a history lesson on the Great Migration. You know, it's uh, right. So this is why if you don't under know this history, I mean, I literally still have family who um, have uh, lived not only all over the United States, but also in Canada because of successive waves of black people seeking out much more than just crumbs right from the table of joy. Um, and so this is a part of my family history. And actually, my parents returned. They did a reverse migration when they moved from Michigan and Washington, D.C. back to my father's hometown of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, in the South. 
But they're like, if you don't know this history, then you're not going to miss all of this complexity. You're going to miss all of this richness. You're going to miss all of this nuance. And it's like coming to the cookout, okay, with the seasoned chicken and the seasoned potato salad versus coming to the cookout with the chicken with a whole lot of mayonnaise and raisins and walnuts. That's how, not how we do the, the potato salad at the cookout. I'm going to stay with this food metaphor. And that's the equivalent of any company, whether it's white or whatever, or whatever it is, putting on this production and not and missing all of this nuance, right? It's missing all of the flavoring and it's colonizing it in a very problematic way and uh, creating perhaps intentional harm in a very problematic way. Next slide, please. The heart of hope, the heart of hope. So I think it's so interesting that it is 17 year old Ernestine who is the narrator as, as well as right an active uh, participant in the life of her family as it unfolds in, uh, you know, after on the hills of the death of her mother, Sandra, and then once the family relocates. And I also want to say in terms of the Great Migration, um, I love teaching on the Great Migration. It's not a subject that is covered very frequently at all in K through 12 or higher education. And many of the, the driving forces of the Great Migration actually wasn't religion, right? The father got me, Godfrey pursues this divine, divine, whatever self-appointed Messiah. And is uh, learning about this um, kind of a early 1950s version, version of an ev evangelist. Um, but like most, the millions of black people who fled the South were fleeing towards opportunity, um, were fleeing towards living fully, right? In terms of their, of housing, of healthcare, of education, of jobs, and of being able to also flee the terror, the economic and the political and the social oppression and terror and literal death, right? They, that's what they were fleeing. But in the case of Godfrey, that's not why he relocates with his family. He's obviously racked with grief over the death of his wife. And he's looking for any way to kind of work through that grief. And that's one of the reasons why Lynn Nonage is a Pulitzer Prize winning play playwright, because she really humanizes her the characters in her play and she gives them all of this richness and makes them very multidimensional. And, and they're contradictory too, because, right, as, I mean, that's radical to help to breathe life into Black characters who are fully human and who jump off the page as fully human, because that's what it did for me. And so 17-year-old Ernestine is the narrator and going through all of these experiences and these kind of these different pulls uh, when it comes to let's talk about representation and wanting to be an actress. And I did it, putting that towel on her head and pretending like it was long silken locks and straight hair and that she was going to be an actress because she was going to somehow go from being a young black girl or a colored girl, as it was called in the 50s, to being a white actress. So it, it, this ties right back into a couple of other talks that, that, that Sister Tree and I have given. Uh, but And she goes on, you see Ernestine's growth with an evolution with the influence of auntie, of the of the cool auntie uh, living apolo unapologetically out loud and, uh, and, and how she chafes at the constrictions imposed by her father. And then also by bringing this German white woman uh, into the house when Godfrey, her father, clearly did not decide to return the passes that were being made you know, by his uh, sister-in-law, um, Lily. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about the aunties. I'm a proud, proud auntie, proud great auntie. And so it's just so wonderful to see this uh, kind of homage and this central role played by Aunt Lily, who really lives and dies out loud. She lives and dies out loud in this play. It's a very powerful message of she refuses to simply settle for crumbs at the table of joy. She reclaims our, our African ancestral religious roots versus uh, practicing a very, very incredibly misogynistic form of Christianity, right? She uh, it does not, she kind of poo-poo's marriage and says, why would you settle for one man when 
You can have relationships with, with a variety of men over the course of your life. She is a communist, right? She's very critical. She is a radical revolutionary social justice activist who lives out her, her life out loud, boldly, unapologetically. She uses profanity. She curses. She sweeps into the lives of her aunts and back into the life of her former brother-in-law, uh, wearing her red suit and and uh, just being that auntie, right, who's full of sass, who's full of uh, dash, and who's very saucy, and who is really able to impact her nieces in a relatively uh, short period of time. And as we know, this is a long-standing and rich tradition of inter intergenerational sisterhood among Black women within that extended family context, and even having people who are uh, not even biologically related to us, but who we can, who adopt us, right, as their kin. And so I've had aunties, I have uh, kin-based mothers. I mean, I have a Gracie Stribling who started out as an aunt, a, a, a fictive kin, kind of what is called anthropologically auntie, who I now call Mama Gracie, right? Especially because my mom is deceased. So I have a couple of mothers, right? And so there, there's so much to this and it's, the way that Lynn Nottage pays homage to this and shows the influence uh, upon Ernestine and, and, and Ermina, her younger sister, who's very feisty, right? She, she's, she's the warrior. She's the gladiator. And, and Ernestine is too in, in her own way. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So I touched a bit on this really, really important political and economic and social context of the Great Migration and how Lynn really kind of complexifies what's happening with this family around relocating to New York, 1950s. We know the Great Migration lasted from about 1910 to the 1970s, so a little bit more than 60 years. But like, so this is towards the end of the Great Migration, right? And again, Godfrey is not relocating himself and his two daughters to New York because, you know, uh, primarily because of Jim Crow segregation and anti-Blackness and oppression. He's doing it because he's trying to deal with and kind of outrun the grief over his wife's death. And what I want to talk about is I love teaching about this and I'm always researching. So there really was this entire clash between Black Americans moving from the South with the um, Black Americans who had been in New York for uh, generations. And this is a clash on many different levels. It's about socioeconomic status. It's about culture. And it's about this notion of country Negroes, which is, and like Sadidi city folks. And Sadidi is a term that means, you know, highfalutin people who, you know, uh, black people who think that they're superior and they look down on country Negroes because they're backwards, they're poor, they're rough around the edges, they're not polished. So like just in like, Lynn, I added Sadidi and before I, because I was like, before I got to the end part where it's like, oh, wow, she actually uses the term Sadidi in the play because that's what it is. And this, she's, there's so much here because now, like within an intersectional um, Black feminist framework, she's talking about socioeconomic status. She's talking about respectability politics, especially in relation to bougie or bourgeois Black culture, right? She's talking about it within an intersectional, intersectional context of the bat, this notion of the Black American princess versus the country girl. And even Lily is like, you know, she's even struggling with that. And you can even see these contradictions play out at the intersection of race, of gender, and of socioeconomic status in uh, places of origin. Because Lily is straightening the heck out of Armina's uh, hair. She's challenging Ernestine's aspirations to be able to become an actress and where she's the only representation she sees are white women. And she kind of distinguishes between, well, why couldn't daddy bring a French woman or a British woman? Why do you have to bring this German Marlene Dietrich bootleg version of like Mar Marlene Dietrich? Well, I'm like, they're all European and they're all white. Right. And, and Lily challenges this. Well, I like you a little bit better as a color girl, but she's still, your hair has got to be flowing in the wind and, um, and you've got to outdress the white girl. So in a sense, it's like, it's really interesting because it's play, it's his play on outdoing white womanhood at its own game, right? Which is these beauty standards, but it's not about buying into respectability politics, not 
not the way that Lily, Aunt Lily is practicing it and not in the way that she's communicating, code switching to her nieces. What I would say is Armina is the fighter. She goes in and those to Diddy city girls with their cashmere sweaters and their relaxed hair. And she literally fights them. And she ends up right, literally taking a piece of what's called greasy relaxed hair and a piece of the cashmere sweater in her pocket home with her. And what I also think is very, very interesting about the great migration and about this real clash that happened between Southern blacks who were newer transplants versus the blacks who were more established in New York and throughout the Northeast is it was actually Southern blacks who brought jazz. Jazz was, it's that's so associated with New York. It's so associated with the Harlem Renaissance, right? It's so associated with the Cotton Club and stopping at the Savoy. It was those country Negroes who brought jazz with them to New York. It was those country uncouth Negroes that brought the blues that would later create rock and roll. So this, the whole beatnik culture, everything from beatniks to Jimi Hendrix to Dylan, uh, Bob Dylan, it was those country Negroes who brought that, all of that as a result of the great migration. And so I think it's this, right? You, and you wouldn't know that. And the fact that if you didn't know the history, if you don't come from the communities, because I grew up with all of it. I grew up with the blues. I grew up with um, rock, rockabilly. I grew up with bluegrass. I grew up with country. I grew up with jazz. I grew up with rock and roll. I grew up with folk music. I grew up with all of it. And I think what's also really interesting is how she integrates this kind of, she integrates, Lynn Nottage integrates jazz into the play itself, especially with Ermina, who becomes very cool because she's the one who's much more um, kind of in your face. She's a fighter, like she's in your face about it. And then all of a sudden she gets all of this cultural capital because daddy's married to a white woman. So it's like now she's popular with the boys and Ernestine is like, look, girl, the only reason why you're even a thing is because Mary da daddy married a white woman. That's it. Right. And Armina's like, well, I'm, she she takes uh, several pages out of Aunt, Auntie Lily's book. She's like, well, I'm going to use it and work it to my advantage. And you stay away from me because you're too much of a square. Right. You're too much of a nerd. And so, but I think it's also really important to note all of this richness and all of this complexity and the fact that Lynn Nottage is integrating jazz into the text of the play. And I think that's very important because it's actually, again, jazz would never have um, even made its way to New York or played such a prominent role in the Harlem Renaissance and beyond if it had not been for the Great Migration. Next slide, please. And I know Sister Tree is going to go in and she's going to elaborate on these themes. So we, we've got to talk about this really interesting dynamic of from Jim Crow segregation to interracial relationships. Who's deserving of love? Who get to some love is given to some heaven is given. So we know that ultimately Aunt Lily was killed. She was murdered for, be, for her revolutionary work, for living out loud. And Godfrey ends up marrying Gert after meeting her, and she's very down and out on the subway. And not only, and, and so this notion of kind of, this is, it gets really complex. It gets really nuanced. I mean, we, and there's a lot of, we got the gender wars going on on social media. They have been, yeah, we got the manosphere where black men are coming out on social media and talking about how much, and not all, but like, this is what's happening on social media to put this in context um, and to give it some, and, and to show how Lynn Nottage was actually ahead of her time when we have some of those really poignant scenes and heated scenes between Aunt Lily, Godfrey, and Gert, who ends up calling for him to kick Aunt Lily out of the apartment. Like, why is she in here anyway? And Godfrey's like, well, because... Um, She's family and Ernestine and Armina, she's family. She's our mother's sister. She's the last. And Gert puts her foot down. And so they are, they, they, they've shifted into full archetype mold. So this is Miss Anne, right? This is the Mrs. of the plantation. It's like supplanting the black woman from within, right? Her own home and our own positioning in our own communities. 
and colonizing, right, in a very white supremacist way and displacing Aunt Lily. So not only, according to this, is Aunt Lily not deserving of love and she continues to unapologetically live her life out loud, she's also not deserving of love in its multiple forms and being able to stay with her family, right, and being able to stay in the same household with her nieces. And as they very aptly point out, Godfrey went from worshiping divine and worshiping religion, the colonizers, right, Christian, white Jesus religion, to worshiping the crown jewel of white supremacy itself, which is white womanhood itself. That's what this is about. And if you don't, if, if any, if, if you don't get that, then you don't, you, to me, it's, you're not worthy of putting on a production of this play. If you don't get it at that level, right, that large macro archetypal level, that's what this is about. This is about internalized anti-Blackness. This is about the fact that white supremacy and colonization was intersectional. It was about gender. It was about socioeconomic status. And it was about race. And Godfrey is doing his own way of trying to live out loud. So he criticizes Lily for being a dangerous woman, right? She's too dangerous. She's a communist and she's radical and she's calling out anti-Blackness. But then you marry a white woman in, 19, in the 1950s. So, you know, which, which one is it? You're willing to go there with marrying a white woman, but you're going to criticize Aunt Lily because she's too radical. And, um, and ultimately, both girls end up leaving the household, even though Godfrey does find a job like white living small, only settling for crumbs. And the crumbs are littered, like literally scattered throughout the play when it comes to the shining the shoes that are really worn and old with newspaper, when it comes to not being able to even consider getting a TV or even being able to listen to the radio, um, this very constricted, very narrow, almost like a coffin-like existence, even in the North, even up North or down North, right? down north or up south, um, really eking out this, this, ex this existence where you're only worthy of crumbs. And Aunt Lily comes in and she's like, no, you are worthy of the entire banquet. And ultimately, she is not only kicked out of the family home, but she also ends up being murdered because of unapologetically living out loud as a Black woman. Whereas Gert is able to come in and literally set up house in um, this formerly Black household, right, white supremacy infiltrating, right, Blackness itself. And ultimately, all of the girls, all of the Black girls and then young Black women end up leaving, right, this household so that Godfrey is able to stay um, in his, uh, in the apartment with uh, his German white wife. Next slide, please. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Sister Tria. So I, <laughs> can we go back really quickly? Because when you're talking, the book that I thought of were was all the women are white, all the men are black, all the blacks are men, but some of us are, are brave. Because in this triad between Goethe, which is very interesting that we make Goethe a German immigrant, right? So we have to consider the context of the time, we also have to consider like the underpinning of what is being said is that even someone who was complicit in um, the Holocaust still gets to be a woman deserving of protection, right? So Gerda goes on and she says that some horrible things happen, but yes, but did you stand up against the regime of Hitler? No, you had privilege enough to get on a a streamliner and you come to America where you fall into the hands of like the benevolent black savior who is always male um, and he gets to play the hero. But this, this triad here, like before Goethe gets here, I think it's really important that we understand that Lily comes and yes, she kisses her, her, you know, um, Godfrey, but she is the one who's holding down the girls because Godfrey has no idea on what it means to like actually raise children, right? So he was working. Um, his wife was then at the time, um, she was a stay-at-home mom. And this is very, very 
I don't want to miss this part either because Black women who decided to stay home was not because they were ascribing to the traditional notions of white womanhood of the 50s. And so this is very important that we understand this because you were not considered a woman, period, if you were a Black woman. But if you had to work, that was absolutely against social standards at the time. So the idea that Black men were not being paid well enough and we're all moving north or migrating to escape terror or um, whether it be physical harm and terror of white supremacist groups in the South or the terror of the heart, which is I am grieving because I, you know, like life doesn't make sense. Women deciding to stay home is a very political move, Black women, because they're trying to position their families to not just survive, but thrive. Right. And so you have these two girls who are in school, who are in school full time, who are not um, picking cotton or are working in the fields in Pensacola, Florida. And the mother who is very, very um, dedicated to that practice. Right. And maintaining a home. It gets us into this conversation about black women in the division of labor. And so I'm going to pull on Patricia Hill Collins here and Black Feminist Thought, where we talk about like one of the things we have to really grapple with is how women, Black women make meaning of their work. Lily shows up to continue the praxis, right? Albeit in a different setting, they're not in the South, but as, as we said before, it was either up South or down North. She shows up to continue this because this unpaid communal familial labor that Aunt Lily is providing is a form of resistance. She is preparing her nieces to go out into this world and doing so in a way that shows them a different side of their mother, right? Um, the other thing is that Black women in the paid uh, and paid marketplace labor is really a form of survival. So if you have two, two of the family working at the same time, it's really about how do we survive the drought? And so Pensacola, Florida is located like, you know, near the Mississippi Delta and what have you. And what we know of the Mississippi Delta in this region, right, there is no disconnection between Florida or Alabama or Mississippi. Jim Crow is Jim Crow is Jim Crow. Um, and so this idea that a mom did not work is very revolutionary and resistant to what we believe black womanhood is. So Patricia Hill's Patricia Hill Collins goes on to say in her in her seminal work, Black Feminist Thought, that black women who stayed home weren't doing it because we were trying to be codified or defined as women, or uh, we weren't doing it to have the full access and rights and privileges of white womanhood. Instead, what we were doing is we were trying to bolster our families to strengthen our families. And so this idea of the mom staying home and then dying and Aunt Lily showing up there, therefore after, really is not even, is what, what we're seeing is a form of resistance, an absolute form of resistance in ways that are not centering whiteness, right? So then Godfrey comes and he finds Goethe literally stranded in a subway and gives her something to eat. And then brings this woman home because Goethe allows him a certain privilege, a privilege that automatically locks out and erases all of the work that Lily has done up until this point to, to get her nieces through to support her um, to, to support her children, her, her sister's family, but then also to be a support to Godfrey as well. We find out later on in this play that Godfrey has feelings for Lily, but doesn't want to express said feelings because what, what does he do with them? Like the ways that she speaks and talks are just like, is that something that I can benefit from? And I don't think that he was actually thinking of this in terms of like, oh, I get these benefits. But this also happens so many times when we talk about the division of labor and how Aunt Lily's contributions go unnoticed. So Gerda pulls up to a house that is structured, um, multi-generational, um, different structure, and she gets to play house while Lily loses the safety of a house. I think, I don't, you know, I just, there, there are these pieces in here in this play 
And Greta says to Lily at one point, why do you always take what I mean and flip it? And Lily says, I'm not flipping it. It is what it is. You, you get the privilege of seeing it just one way that you just want the best for them. Um, and even the idea of, um, you know, the girls, you know, saying to their dad, you know, no, I don't want my name to change. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really okay. Um, Lily becomes this, the last connection to their mother that they have because Godfrey doesn't want to talk about her at all. Instead, he wants to replace her with this next best thing, which is Gerda. And that's no replacement at all. Um, so when I think about Black women in the division of labor and what this means when we're like representing who gets to be loved, who gets to have a family, who gets to be stable, um, it reminds me of this idea um, that Audre Lorde talked about when we're talking about self-definition of uh, when, when we're thinking about like, oh, well, um, Lily was there, but she was so loud and she smoked and she did all these other things. Is that becoming of womanhood? Is that becoming of how we're supposed to actually be looking at um, these pieces? And it's sad, but it also leads us into this idea of self-definition and womanhood. And, and so I pulled this quote from Patricia, Patricia Hill Collins' book, Black Feminist Thought, and it's like chapter five, and it's about the power of self-definition. It's so interesting that she uses this quote. And Audre Lord says, in order to survive, those of us whom oppression is as American as apple pie have always had to be watchers. This watching, this watching generates a dual consciousness in African-American women. Now, I'm pulling this purposely, because I also want to bring up W.E.B. Du Bois in here, who talks about double consciousness, right? This idea that we're born understanding that we are both American and Black, and sometimes those two things conflict and compete against each other. Well, in this story, it is Black women who are centered, and we're seeing all of the ways that they are erased through the division of labor, through being able to define who they are, even when it comes down to like, I think Sweet Father Divine was like, I've decided to name your kids this. And Ermina was like, I will not be named that at all. My name is Ermina, right? In the ways like, and, and Godfrey's willingness to have his daughters renamed is very interesting as well because he is removing the last, or by doing so, he is removing this last connection to mom and Lily. Now, there was something that I, that was really interesting, um, Dr. Rofe, about you saying that Greta comes in and puts her foot down and Godfrey's like, well, it's whatever Greta says. At some point in this play, these two girls were working in service, supporting an older white couple who lived either above them or below them. And the father says, those white folks mean you no good. You come in here. You, you cannot have access to these things. And this is really important because in a matter of a second, he's coming home from work from the bakery and he picks up a white wife. And not just any white wife, a German immigrant white wife. And we know this in this country that miscegenation has never meant any good, especially during this time period, like you could literally be hung for whistling or the accusation of whistling at a white woman. So on the one hand, he tells his daughters, no, these white folks mean you no good. You cannot go up and watch TV. TV is a sin. Sweet Father Divine says all this other stuff, but then is allowed to benefit off of that same whiteness. And what it reminds me of so many times is how white women and Black women um, are not the same. They are not the same at all. <laughs> so the ways that Black men can benefit off of relationships with white women, this has never been, uh, that hasn't always been the same for Black women, especially here. And especially, like, even though it's so nuanced, I'm like, wow, what must, what must it be like to preach to your daughters, according to Sweet Father Divine, who we figure out is a swindler at some point that you're 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 using this other black man to dictate the lives of your children but then you bring home the very thing that they can't access 
And I don't, I don't necessarily, like, we know a lot of stuff was happening during this time period, but I also think it's very important when we think about were those girls ever allowed to define themselves and where would they have been without an Aunt Lily, who is other mother, who is fictive kin, who is intergenerational um, sisterhood. And I think when we put all of these pieces together, this play is so much more than just a, oh, look what we're going to do for Black History Month. <laughs> If you do not understand the nuances of how this play kind of fits together, or um, I think I saw somewhere where Aunt Lily was supposed to have died of a drug overdose. <laughs> Dr. Rofe, Dr. Rofe is livid over here. She was supposed to, she was supposed to have died of a drug overdose. We don't even give Aunt Lily credit for the brilliance of what it meant to be a communist at the time, what it meant to be a socialist at the time, what it meant to actually say, this isn't, this system of government is not working for us. And we don't give her, we don't give her credit for being the critical black feminist scholar that she was at the time either. Someone who can actually read the systems and say, these systems aren't working for us. Let me show you, or let me explain to you a better way of doing it. Now, the very thing that the dad was attracted to, and this is a key part here. Yes, I'm attracted to the ability of you to for you to produce Lily, but I cannot profess my love and accept all of you, whether that's romantic or any other way. Um, and I just thought, wow, when we do get the opportunity to hear some of the prayers that he prays to, to Father Divine, in my brain, I was like, <sighs> at what point do Black women get to be fully desired, not just for their production? I mean, this is a thought. <laughs> this is well, my synopsis is done, but it's just the thought that I had. <laughs> and do you have the ability or the fortitude having none of this experience without actually, you know, asking or inquiring? Or here's the thing. Um, we can't just throw productions of another culture on a stage and say, oh, brilliant, brilliant. This requires study. It requires, it requires coming to the table as student um, because I have no problem with people performing plays, but it's the carelessness with which you are going to just throw a culture on the stage and say, what do you think? Shouldn't we feel great about ourselves? Oh, beautiful and we got a black woman poet that is the reduction of a black woman to her parts her ability to produce something that gives you clout or credit and that is scary and problematic i don't know dr Rope, what you think Woo! <laughs> you said it. i'm still i'm still on when do we get to be fully desired? And I was playing with the slide presentation and, and the titles, and, and I was really getting at this kind of uh, radical joy as self, uh, or joy, um, claiming joy as radical self-love. And at this point in my life, <laughs> be, at the auntie and great auntie and really close to being an elder and on my way to becoming an ancestor. I know who I am. And I know that anyone that I decide to grace with my attention and my time is blessed. And I want to feel that way about them because I know that about myself. So, right. It's, it's, it's starting out from that place deep in my core um, knowing I am all of these things, right? I am all of these facets of what it means to be woman, of what it specifically means to be a Black woman. And that there is nothing more desirable than that in the cosmos, right? That's, I know that. Yeah. And let those who have ears to hear and who, right, hear and receive it because they are out there. But first it means I know that. Right, just like Aunt Lillian. The Aunt Lilies, they're the trailblazers. Like I get to live even more out loud in full technicolor because of all of the generations of aunties and intergenerational 
um, you know, black women and everyday goddesses. And mm -hmm. he doesn't get it. I mean, I will. Okay. So can we just keep it all the way real? Yes. Do we ever not? <laughs> I mean, I'm about to go there, Sister Tria. I'm about to go there. I have tea. Oh, yes, you do. I finish it. I literally had a brother because I still, it's, just, it's, I still love my brothers. It's who literally was talking to me and saying, and it's, uh, talking about the way I looked. He's like, oh, the white men must just be all over you. They just must be all. So basically it's this whole, like, is that what you need? Do, are, are we gatekeeping desirability? And so basically uh, as a whole, black women are, are this, that, and the other, but not desirable or the least desirable, unless someone like a white man, like the white gaze approves it. But what is like, dude, do you hear yourself? Do you hear what's wrong with you? No, that's not mm -hmm. my purpose test. It's not even about a male gaze, period. Right. right? I'm here. I'm, you know, I, I, it's, I'm here. If you want to come rock with me, I'm here. If not, peace, deuces, have a great life. It's all good. But this centering of white, black men wanting, like having this really garbled, um, uh, we're so pro, like we want to dismantle white supremacy, but we really want to take the place of white men. And we literally want to literally like, it's like the reverse get out instead of white people trying to embody black bodies. It's the opposite. And it's not just right. But in the, it's like, but desirability is based on like, you can't even make up your own mind. You can't even enact your own agency. Like literally you will think all of these sisters are beautiful, except that we're black. So we're not desirable unless we are desirable according to the white gaze. Yes. Uh <laughs> I, this is really interesting because I don't know if y'all know, do y'all remember like the height of the 90s, mid 90s, the conversation on a lot of black talk shows was black men, white women. Um, the football player who makes it big and then leaves and goes and dates, um, leaves the sister who like held him down to then go and get someone else. And, and mind you, y'all, like while this has, while this seemingly has taken a turn, it has not. Um, we're still talking about the same play. Um, and we also want to say this, love who you love, because this, this, this ain't, <laughs> this is not that. Um, but uh, someone just, remind, I think Kara just reminded me, it was called the come up, right? So you got your million dollar, your multi-million dollar contract, and you, you got this like beach bunny, essentially, right? And that was like the epitome of, um, of success. And so I think it speaks directly to what you're saying is that for black women, we're like, this is not the epitome of success. When we look at black feminist thought, us making these sacrifices, us this unpaid labor that we do to make sure that you're good and you're straight and you're not getting ran over, that our babies are good, that they know how to count before getting to kindergarten. All of this is about the amassing of political power to strengthen our unit so that we have choice. And this sacrifice that's being made, right, is not being honored or it's being honored and then traded in because now you've gotten me to this status and now I'm going to trade you in. While in the, and, you know, again, love who you love, but don't do it on our backs. And that is what I feel like when when I figured out Aunt Lily had died because of her beliefs, I'm like, you uncovered her and she held you down and you had feelings for her, but you wouldn't confess them. And then you bring home something that allows you to be the hero. And you sacrifice the trust of even your own daughters who are like, Harpo, who this woman? <laughs> or daddy, who this woman? Uh, do you know? So I, <laughs> when you say that, I'm like, yes, exactly. Um, and it's heartbreaking a little bit. It's absolutely heartbreaking because before Gerda gets there, Lily is holding that house down. She is managing the grief of her nieces. She is making it possible for Godfrey to go out and do the work in the world. And the critique, I was like, oh, 
Lynn, you could, uh, I know why you put this critique in here, but even Gerda's critique of Lily, I'm like, you're not qualified. You are absolutely not qualified. You are absolutely not qualified to have this conversation. You are not qualified to school Lily on why she has entered a functional depression. Because there's also that in there as well. I don't know. Well, I, lo I love it. I love that. I do really appreciate that Lynn in included that because, I mean, this is still ongoing. I mean, this is the way that these, this is part of the great chasm that, that unfortunately divides black women from white women and, and other women of color to different degrees. And you absolutely cannot speak on to, uh, to our positioning, to our, to our lived experiences knowing nothing, coming into the community as uh, interlopers and colonizers, unless you're doing the work. Um, and, and this, these kind of conversations still happen, right? It's, it's either, you know, it's, you're so far down here, or I'm going to criticize you and, and uh, from my pedestal and my lofty positioning, or it's, um, well, Black women save us and be, I mean, it, it, there's part of that. And not that that's what Aunt Lily was doing within this context, because she also clearly needed a place to stay. Now, she had her own very diva-like, right, very sassy way of even how she gained entry into the household versus white, because it wasn't about, she did not position herself as if she were a damsel in distress, Right. She, she had that pride and that understanding of her value and what she had to offer, whereas Gerda was desperate and clinging and, uh, you know, begging, right, Godfrey to save her. And so it's this black women are going to save us. I'm like, save who? We're not doing any of this for you. We never done. We've never done any of this for you. Right. It's black women in defense of ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like what? Yes. Period. And Aunt Lily uses that a lot. That period stop. I was like, I was like, were we seeing a period back in the nineties? I just love. I I just love Lynn. I I love the. I was literally reading it out loud on the different characters' voices because I love to do that. And I went into my full country Southern accent. I had, and that I really felt them. That's when I really felt like I knew them. So I'm going to stop because it looks like we are ready to transition to a, a Q and A. Yes. I mean, I was fully asking that question of if we were ready because I could just listen to you both talk about this uh, all night, all night long. Um, so I'm going to bounce around actually from some of the, the order that I had some of these questions in because I really just cannot get over the characterization of Aunt Lily. Um, and I put that in our, our behind the scenes chat for our audience who, who does not know um, that when she was being spoken about earlier and the fact that she lived and died in her power and in her voice, just that difference between that interpretation of her and the frequent uh, black feminist interpretation of her of living and dying in that power versus the other interpretation of her as she died probably of a drug overdose. And for those who have not read the play, I would challenge you to uh, read it. It is a, a relatively short read, even though it's very, very um, heavy uh, in its content, but to challenge you to read it so you get to the point where it's referenced that she has died and that her body is being identified and try and figure out how <laughs> how we get to those two different interpretations of what happened to her. Um, so I I'm going to ask this question in what I think is the nicest way to, to put it. Um, why is it that from the Black feminist perspective, Aunt Lily or sister died living in her power 
And from other perspectives, she must have died from a drug overdose. And what might that tell us about where bias and a lack of contextualized voice can contribute to the production or the reception of Black art? Tag on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, so I, I actually want to go back to like an LBE that we had a long time ago about Black womanhood tropes. Um, when we first bring Black women to the United States in, in terms of enslaved bodies, they are not the most valuable at all. The European Western white gaze, if you will, see they see men and boys as valuable. You know, Black women, yep, if they bring them along, fine. I mean, they have to appropriate. But appropriation did not happen in the Caribbean at all. It switches when we get to the United States or the, the colonies. And why this history, this contextualized history is so important is because in order for, the, for us to value Black bodies, they have to produce something, especially Black women. So Black women are not considered Black women. They are, they are still very much property. They are still very much, they feel the tropes of what this white collective consciousness believes that we appear in the world, which is why you can have people who are transracial who only operate from like the Rachel Dolezal checklist of must have Black son, must be oppressed, cannot have joy, right? And so to see them as anything other than um, Mammy, Sapphire, always rolling their heads, lack of intelligence, to see them as anything other than that really bucks up against a historical and perpetuated narrative that still is in play today. So let Michelle Obama very clearly and articulately discuss something as someone who has experience and she becomes hostile. Let Serena Williams um, command respect or any of those things, and she becomes a nagging um, sapphire who uh, her, her job is to uh, dehumanize and emasculate men. So for Aunt Lily, you know, for Black feminists um, who are like, no, she died in her power. She went out believing as she did. She made decisions of her own life. She was not begging anyone to do this. She understood the value of her labor that is a resistance narrative that we that we experience. As Audre Lorde says, we, we have to be watchers and that watchers makes us duly conscious of the world that we live in for others and the world that we keep for ourselves. So how I can say that she died believing how she did, went out in her power, is because I understand that Aunt Lily is a watcher, right? And she is not worried or pressed about conforming to this world that we that we walk around in, but we don't define as our own. That is a world that um, Toni Morrison says the white gaze controls, and she wasn't interested in living according to that world. Now, what that is going to mean for someone doing a production of not just this story, but any Black story, is you have to actually sit with yourself when you're doing that table read, when you're making decisions on this is the play we're going to do. You actually have to sit with yourself and say things like, now, why would I believe that she died of a drug overdose? Whose narratives am I holding up or perpetuating? What part of this is not full or true? Where, I, where am I not actualized, right? In, in my thoughts about what Black men, women are or who they can become or who they're capable of being. What are the narratives that I haven't, you know, challenged within my own selves? How, you know, what measure of anti-Blackness am I walking around here with operating, making crazy assumptions? And I also want to go back and say this. Dr. Rogue said something that was really profound that I don't want us to miss out on is that you can internalize colonization. You can internalize anti-Blackness as a Black person, as a person of color, as a supposed woke person who is down for the cause and believe that everyone is a human and I don't see color. You can internalize those things and still come to a table and say, well, it's evident that she died of a drug overdose, don't you think? What if she died of a broken heart? Because there's evidence to suggest that as well. And I think that anybody who is sitting down to make decisions about a production of a story, of a culture that you do not belong to, 
or have no direct experience with. And I don't mean I grew up, I grew up around, around, around in a multicultural neighborhood. If you have not had these conversations yourself, your bias is going to show in the decisions that you make, in the lighting that you choose, in the money that you're willing to invest in the makeup artists who will do the hair and the makeup of your Black actors and actresses. It's going to show up because whiteness is normalized, then it's like evident, oh, you know, black women killed themselves because they were probably doing drugs. And who, who, and, who and what told you what that narrative, who and what told you that that narrative was the truth? And why haven't you interrogated it? Um, Dr. Rope, you wanna jump in? Please do. I mean, thank you. And I'm gonna riff right off of you. Let's get to some freestyle jazz up in here. So I'm not surprised the cognitive dissonance of that interpretation is just breathtaking to me. Aunt Lily, her character is written in broad, bold brushstroke, brushstrokes. It, it, it's so clear and explicit and even tying in the hearing of the McCarthy, right? Red Scare and talking about Red Scare in the 50s. We know McCarthyism was at an all time high. We knew how actors and politicians were being blacklisted and um, and I'm just going to go to the epilogue on 85 and just very quickly say that ne once you get to the end, you realize that, Armina, it's almost like a looking back at her life in retrospect and, and then forward winding it in the epilogue and says that um, when she goes to identify Aunt Lily's body and she makes that connection that dr allen was referring to as being kicked out of the home and the protection and the safety and the security of being in that home um and being in that book being in that family network right is being exiled from that she'll move home with a uh uh she'll move home with okay that was that was actually uh or, Ernestine's talking about her little sister, Armina. She'll, Armina will move home with Nana for a few years and she'll be the one to identify Lily's cold body poked full of holes. I get bullet wounds when I read that. I mean, it is left somewhat open to interpretation. That's, I've, I don't, that's not how you describe someone who's died from overdosing from drugs, typically. And it's just, it is everything that Dr. Allen is saying. It's specifically the massage noir, which is also really this, unfortunately, we can talk about what's uh, Joseph Conrad and Heart of Darkness. And the Heart of Darkness is colonization. The Heart of Darkness is not the continent of Africa. It is not Black people. It is not the descendants from American chattel slavery. The Heart of Darkness is white supremacy. And at the Heart of Darkness is this double-edged sword of literally building white supremacy on the backs and bodies and from the wounds and labor of black women and then and and the hatred all of the hatred and it's just it's the cognitive dissonance for me that is really like the to the point like joy degruy really goes into this when she talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome and the real toll the price that is paid the price of privilege ex privilege extracts to me a price that is truly a, a, a bargain with the devil. It's Mephistophelian in, in, in those proportions. It's truly epic. And that, like how anyone gets any of that out of seeing Aunt Lily is one of the most clearly written and boldest characters. And I would say the boldest one and the most kind of unambiguous one of the whole play. And they don't get it. They don't. She's a communist. She is obviously flouting gender norms. And the fact that any woman and a white woman reading that who can't like that's a point of intersection. That's a point of building common ground. But somehow she still ends up being cast as someone who died of drug overdose, because when it comes to white supremacy versus gender, we can look at the voting records. White women choose white supremacy over gender. Majority do majority of the time. That's a hard truth. And the data doesn't lie about that. So it's the cognitive dissonance of, for, of it all for me, which where you're like, like, this is a young adult, like this is a play that, I mean, you could, I'm sure I would love to do this with like black high school and college students, actually. I would love, 
it's like they can understand it. What are you not getting? It's not like how it's the cognitive dissonance. And I will say this, and this is a harder truth. And I growing up in Arkansas, my parents both said that they hated the label white liberal. Because they understood it. They were like, these are the people who will stab you in your back and smile in your face. We call it wokeness or allyship or whatever, but it's like, but you're and move, I'll, I'll move exactly like the January 6th insurrectionists, move exactly like co-opting language. And, but like that my parents were both like, call me N-I-G-G-E-R with the hard art of my face. This stuff called white liberals, they don't trust it. Don't trust it. And finally, we all have our work to do around this. People do not understand structural racism. They don't understand conditioning. They think it's something individual. It's like, no, we all have internalized this conditioning to some degree. Now, what it looks like for the work, it's, and I've been doing, I didn't, I've been doing the work. I didn't come out of the womb with melanated skin and all of it. I just came out like this. I, I had to do a lot of work and I continue to do the healing work. And people just be getting too caught up in their fragility and their ego. It's like, boo-boo, we ain't got time for that. We've all internalized this conditioning. I've been doing the work for how, however many decades, how, and I've been living it. How long have you been doing it? Then don't talk to me. Go back and do your work. It's like being a teacher. You need to belong in this group but based on readiness level. You're, you're not here yet, and I don't have time for anybody. I don't have time. I'm no, Mammy is dead. I don't have time. Which is something that Aunt Lily says too, right? The, uh, in the play at different moments when she's interacting with uh, Gerda, she says, don't burden me with your apologies or you don't get to tell me what this experience is because you've never lived it. So it's there's some really powerful stuff happening in this play. Um, I wanna frame the conversation a little bit in terms of some of the, uh, the background with Lynn Nottage, and then ask a couple of questions about some of the lines within the play, and then wrap us up getting back to the importance of, of uh, the voice that we're um, saying needs to be part of this conversation. So uh, first question is, Lynn Nottage has written many powerful plays, um, two of which, as we've already acknowledged, were Pulitzer Prize winners. Yet, Crumbs from the Table of Joy seems to be the one that many kind of hone in on as the, the safe or the Black story to tell, um, despite the fact that it, it faced a lot of critique as one of her early and introductory plays. Um, and it was actually somewhat dismissed by many of uh, her critics as being, this is you know the work of a beginner. Um, so why do you think that it's one that directors lean on as representative of her work or as uh, a Black play worth sharing? Dr. Rofe, I'll kick that to you first. Okay, I won't. It's, uh, it's comfortable because people don't understand it. They don't understand the layers. They don't understand what she was trying to do. Um, and I think initially it was actually, I don't know if it was intended. Um, again, it was kind of like a, it's, it's almost like, I mean, it's like a young adult kind of a play in some ways, but I think it's very, and it's, it's very easy to flatten it for white audiences. I think it's very easy to make it palatable. And I absolutely think because it has a white woman at the center Gertha. And it also has the white woman supplanting the black woman and marrying the black man. I mean, so what's, what's, I mean, what's for them not to like, quite frankly, especially if you flatten it and you just whitewash out all of the nuance and all of the context. I said, I knew she was going there. <laughs> I knew she was going there. Um, and I would also say that as well, like you don't have to do, you know, it, it appears on the surface level, like, look, love conquers all. And they stood together. Um, love does not conquer all at all. 
And I think, like, as we said when we first started this, this play is extremely dense, extremely dense. And if you cannot see the density of this play, then it probably means that um, you have not thoroughly studied and you don't know the backstory or the history or why it makes, um, why this one would, would seem infantile, right? Um, when it first came out. Uh, and, and I know just reading, just reading it, I didn't even see it performed. I heard it performed, but just reading it, I just thought, oh, 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 we going there? This, this is where we're going. But if you don't have that, um, if you don't have the ancestral or the generational wisdom that comes with being a black woman, I'm just gonna say it. Um, you'll read right through this and think eh, it ends nicely. The, the cantankerous loudmouth aunt dies of a drug overdose. I mean, but that's what's going to happen. It seemingly perpetuates stereotypes, but in the like, you have to really read through it to see that it doesn't. But at first glance, it's an easy. We'll put it on stage. It's been done before. We can. There's there's theater notes. We can go on YouTube and see clips. Um, I think that's the reason why it probably got chosen. Uh, one of the interesting issues with this play is the the way it represents the black family. Um, there's the the black father who essentially abandons his family for a period of I think it's three days or possibly more um, to find it of the home and finds it and comes back with this white German woman. Um, and what strikes me in this is the use, the fact that this play is used as representative of Black family and Black community, often by predominantly white serving organizations that decide to put this play on, um, is something that we acknowledged at the beginning that misses some of those critical elements of the play and the unique Black narrative it, it shares. So uh, we're not talking about gatekeeping, right? We're not saying that uh, we are, we're not denying access to our stories as part of or woven into the larger story of the nation. Um, so what are we talking about when we're talking about the the conflict that comes from putting on this production without having that context behind it? What's the context and the place from which uh, we approach, or what makes the context from which we approach this narrative so important when putting on this play? Um, for those of y'all who don't have it and you're putting it on, let's be real, you're doing it for trauma porn. You're doing it because it 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 uh it confidently and because a black woman wrote it we didn't say it so we're not racist it it like confirms the thoughts that you have right the importance of actually dissecting it the way that we did and and let's be real honest we're, we're doing this really quickly for the benefit of the broadcast because we can take part one and just sit with part one for days. There's so much that happens in just part one, even before Goethe comes into the story. So if you are, for, for organizations who don't have the backstory, who are just like, oh, this is really great. It's a Black woman. And we think a Black woman is confirming what we believe or what has been normalized or we've been socialized in about Black communities and Black women then it's trauma porn. Trauma porn in the sense of, see, they're just so disadvantaged. Look at, oh, these poor black kids. And I, you know, my mother adopted my best friend and trauma porn. But there's so much more that goes on. We, we didn't even dig into like the joy spaces, right? Of Aunt Lily and the interactions when Ernestine becomes aware of her womanhood like all I could think of was Rudy and her mom in um, the Cosby show when, when Rudy got her period and her mom was like, it's women's day. And the celebration of the beautiful, the beautifulness in that, 
we didn't dig into those pieces. But if all you're all you're seeing is the suffering and how these kids end up, see, they still survived. They came along and they still survived after it really what it does is it like reinforces for you like, oh, these narratives are true. And then it's confirmed for you because, well, it's a black woman writer. We didn't say it. It's what she wrote. And this is the necessity of a critique and of a discussion of this nature. Otherwise, you will completely, you'll completely like go through life thinking that that's the truth. And so this critique is out of love and out of correction so that you don't make a fool of yourself. Yeah. And Dr. Allen, I would just add on that the message that it sends is very powerful and it's very insidious, which is not actually the message of the play. Because Aunt Lily, the short time she was in Armina and Ernestine's lives, it had a lasting impact and legacy that lived on much long, like in, in ways that were very different from her fa the father's legacy. But what it shows is that if you dare to be Black and live out loud, there is nothing but destruction in that. And if you try to basically, uh, if you live your life as an anti-Black Black black person, that's kind of the main way, the main pathway, right? For salvation or for just being able to even live with crumbs. And the same is what Audre Lorde says, our silence will not protect us and respectability politics will not protect us. But I think that it's also this on some level, if it's uh, portrayed in this very flat, this very decontextualized and this very overly simplistic way, then it's actually a cautionary tale. See, Black people go back. Just just go back. Just be good, respectable Negro so that you'll be OK, because otherwise the alternative is to end up like uh, like Aunt Lily. So in pulling some quotes to talk about from the play, I, I am scrolling through and just realizing how many of them are from Aunt Lily because she is really the heroine of this play. Um, she is the hero of the story, despite what happens to her at the end. Um, one of her um, speeches in the play comes when Ernestine is putting together her graduation dress. And um, she makes a disparaging remark about the fact that Aunt Lily has had to sell off this suit that was um, so precious to her in, in her pursuit of um, whatever she's doing in her life. Um, and Lily remarks, Ernie, I have a suit upon which I pinned many hopes. And now that suit is in the cleaners waiting for me to find the money to retrieve it. You see what I'm saying? You expecting too much from that blanched mess of fabric. So the play deals with so many different forms of loss. And in this short speech, uh, what I hear Lily speaking to is that sense of loss of identity and hope that gets tied to things that she as a black woman um, with her own thoughts and with her own mind can't really own in a world that denies her the power to have those thoughts. Um, when I think of that message, I, I also thought of Lynn Nottage talking about her place as a Black uh, female playwright and the fact that um, so often her voice was limited to that. She was remarkable because she was a Black female playwright, not because she was a playwright, not because she was telling stories that mattered, but because she was telling them from that identity um, where her white male counterparts in particular did not have that put upon them. So what can we learn <laughs> from this play and from Lynn Nottage about the place of voice and the role of identity in and against systems of white supremacy as the perceived norm um, when it comes to value? I'll start quickly and I'll just start out with the metaphor of the blanched fabric. There is nothing in white supremacy that I want. There is nothing in white womanhood, right? The construct of it that I want. There's nothing appealing about it. 
whiteness itself. It's, I'm not talking about actual cultures. I'm not talking, right? There's nothing redeeming about it. And I think what the reality of this tension and even like the fact that Lenata just recognized as a black woman playwright and even being ordained with the Pulitzer Prize, which is a, is, which is a kind of, it's a white gaze and a white gatekeeping kind of recognition. And what this has done for me and these kind of plays do for me and, you know, Toni Morrison and Gloria Naylor and uh, Maya Angelou and Alice Walker and the list goes on and on is it has pushed me to such a point of spiritual evolution that I do not think is possible would be possible if I were not a black woman. And if I did not come from long ancestors of really strong, powerful black women who dared to live out loud um, and who suffered greatly, who were literally excommunicated from their ancestral tribes, right? That they had been a part of for thousands of years, but they chose to marry a black man, have children with a black man. So they got kicked off of the Pamunkey and the Choctaw rolls because that's how it works. Now the men's can marry anyone they wanted, but the Native American women couldn't. So you're not getting the lineage bone blood quantum or by kinship when you get kicked off of the rolls, right? From your ancestral community. So what it's done for me is to recognize radically my full self, my true self. And that is far beyond any of this. That's, that's far beyond any of this. And that is the key for me living out loud, living boldly, living unapologetically, um, you know, embracing self-love and pleasure activism and fully embracing pleasure activism as well. And that's where it gets really interesting because it's like, I'm looking at your spirit. I'm looking at your spirit. Uh, but that's that's what it does for me. And um, and recognizing that if I say stuck in the paradigm of the world, right, it's it's all it, like as a black woman, it just seems to be no end in sight. But guess what? I'm declaring my full autonomy, my sovereignty and my full power, regardless of what the world says. The world has right, it, it has it has nothing on that. And it, it's really pushed me to that point of spiritual evolution, quite frankly. So <laughs> Lynn Nottage once said that she felt like it was her social responsibility to shine a light on areas that don't get seen. And when the world or the culture is in turmoil, it is the duty of the artists to make that known and understandable so that we can all grapple with it. And so the really important part of, of this voice, this story as an artist, Right. Because I think Toni Morrison says the same thing. Hey, we do we do words, we do language. Um, and it is our job as artists, as humanitarians to bring forth and to make this known. Um, I think this is the importance of it. If she, she feels a social responsibility to say, hey, let's grapple with this. Um, it's very interesting that she does it in the 90s. Um, and I think it's also very interesting that, you know, even in the 90s, I think we were in Desert Storm or we were coming out of Desert Storm. So the parallels between, you know, what's going on in the 90s and these conversations, the complexity of the conversations that are being had, and she takes that, and not that this was her intention, but then places it firmly in the 50s in a very similar, you know, we've got a war going on or it's just ended. We have like the politics of people. We have in the 90s, we have the rise of the black middle class. Like the, all these things that are going on um, that she grapples with, the importance of like shining a light on how these things don't just exist. Like you have to have an intersectional lens when thinking about them. And rather than coming to a table and saying, let's talk about the state of the nation, she says, let's grapple with these in a play that allows us to kind of see the nuances and the complexities of life. Um, and so even when we think about the, the Blanche fabric, right? Like e even that is like, huh, that's such an interesting way to kind of think of the experiences of one particular character who has several intersections um, and several social identities within the context of what is going on in that world. And then how do I see myself in that? 
And then how do I make meaning of the world that I'm in, in looking at that, um, in this piece? It's brilliantly done. And I don't know, like you have to be an artist to kind of understand how to make the complex simple for, for the proletariat to kind of get it. There's a moment towards the end of the play when uh, Ernestine is really starting to grapple with her identity and, and her place and what's happening within her household. And she says at one point, I want to go someplace where folks don't come home sullied by anger. Um, when I read that line and heard it in, in a production that I listened to, I thought instantly of the James Baldwin quote, um, where he says, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost, almost all of the time. Do you think <laughs> that this play is speaking uh, in a way to that sort of a quote? Uh, and if so, where are we being directed as uh, Black people, as Black women, um, to find that place or find those crumbs of joy in the midst of a world that sullies us with anger? So, yes. Um, if I'm reading this through a Black feminist lens, then yes. Um, I do think that this this work kind of reminds us of like, to be, to be aware of the status of the Black women in this play, which is indicative of the larger the society of the Black, of what the status of Black women in society. I think that if you think about it long enough, you'll walk around in a constant rage, constantly. But I also think that this play... Um, very much like James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time and this letter to his his nephew where he's explaining like, listen, your grandfather and your father grew up in this time and all these things were happening, but you are my hope. When we write about these things, when we make these things plain, when we say these things in the voice of, um, of those who are impacted and affected, um, what it allows us to do is to imagine a future that, that's different. It allows us to create the spaces. It allows us to have more than just crumbs of joy. What is it like? What does it look like to create a whole like a whole cake of joy? And what does that look like to experience that as Black women? Because this is the lens from which I am reading this. Um, what What does that look like? What does it look like to not settle for? societal norms that say this is success this is what will make you happy this is what will allow you to be empowered what does it look like to define that for ourselves and so that's the lens with which i am reading this is that yes even though these things were happening even though um godfrey was a jerk and threw aunt lily out i have to go back to her lasting impact on these two girls in ways that um, probably would not have happened if she had not shown up at all. And what their lives will be because of her sacrifice, because of the things that she imparted into them, because of the beautiful scenes where she talks about like, oh, this is what you wanna do. Um, and even Armina, right? And even her finding her her own voice. And even though she gets this bump in status because her father dared marry a white woman in Brooklyn, um, even what that means for her and how it kind of like bolsters her confidence to unapologetically be herself because she's seen a model of that and not in Goethe. That's where my brain goes. And that makes it a little less ragey and more so like, how do we find those micro spaces when I see you walking down the street and I acknowledge you with the, okay, polka dots, or I see you, sis, or a wink, or a, a comment like, okay, hair, um, what that means for us. Um, I will tell you, 
<laughs> if you see me in the store and you have a beautiful black girl child, I love on black girl children in ways that they are not loved on in K through 12 or either in higher ed. I love on my on my girls who come into my office um, and say, yo, Dr. Allen, can I just talk to you for a minute? Because I know that it's not done. And reading books and imagery like this makes me see like what happens if it doesn't happen. But more importantly, it empowers me to do it because I see what happens with Ernestine and Ermina when it does happen and the lasting impacts. And so even if you don't ever graduate in my lifetime at the U of A, but you've had an interaction with me, that love carries you through a little bit longer. So it's not all just rage. It's also understanding I can make a shift and a difference um, as well. And I just like to quickly add on to everything that you just shared that Aunt Lily was a social justice activist, right? She was involved in significant and substantive community-based change and radical ideas that the Communist Party was the only place to do that for Black people at a long, for a long time, even though we know that the Marxist-Leninist kind of framing doesn't address race. It's over, but, and so, um, you know, and so that's a huge part of my life, right? That's been a huge part of my family for generations is actually being engaged in community-based uplift and, and the collective, like we get so much joy out of the collective. And so for me, everything that I do centers around building relationships and collaborations across the board. And it's just so fulfilling and it's, it's, it's food, right? It's soul food. And then to say there is a place to feel the rage and to transmute it. It's a kind of alchemy, right? It's a kind of sacred rage. It's the fire. How do we channel that fire in all of these different ways and in these different outlets? And how do we channel it for ourselves and for our world into the fire that cleanses and purifies. And sometimes that is the power that the, the, the power of the fire to destroy as well. Like, you know, I think of the face of the God of Kali, right. And Hinduism is the destructive face of God. That's a part of the life force. That's a part of the energy. Um, and then I just also go to like, you know, the black, the roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water. <laughs> so it's all of these different kinds of out ways of um, transmuting, right, the rage. And, and part of it is creating the space and giving ourselves the permission to fill that because it's completely human in how could you not, but right then what does it look like, right? What does it look like to to fill that, to process that and to to transmute it? Uh, there was an audience question that I apologize that I missed earlier. Um, it was going back to the uh, Aunt Lily and the question of her death. Um, and the question was, could the supposed drug overdose be a result of a hidden heroin addiction? Um, and um, that came from, from a member of our team. And I think uh, before I turn it over for you as the speakers to, <laughs> to be able to answer. Um, I think one of the things that that stands out to me in this play is how much is not hidden, um, how much is just openly shared, right? At the end of the play, she uh, Ernestine is, is speaking about the death of her aunt and then the future of her own life. And even in that, she very specifically says, I raised one child who goes on to do this. And I lost one son to drugs. So it's very blatantly stated, which raises the question of, then why would you read that into um, Aunt Lily? And really, in, in my reading of it, the only one who ever even attempts to hide things, hide how they're feeling or what they're thinking, is the father. And even with him, you see that crumble under the weight of just the presence of uh, Aunt Lily, who at one point he is talking about how he's not gonna go back to the way he was. And the stage direction literally just says, he smells the air around <laughs> Aunt Lily. And suddenly he launches into this whole other story of what his life of when he actually gave into his passion and his love and, and the interactions that he had with her um, and the end of it is him basically saying, I can't do this again. 
and he leaves. So even then, it's the sense that nothing is, nothing can be hidden in her presence or in her story. So um, I, I, with that, I'm sorry, but I turn it over to you to to address that question um, and just. I'll just, I'll quickly say like, you you just answered the question and you, you really did. And uh, it's very explicit when someone did die of drug, uh, of drug overdose. And I think it is interesting though. But I would just say the content, like, first of all, uh, critical reading, basic reading comprehension, where are the context clues to support that? Where I like literally going back on the text and highlighting it. And, for, and then I would say on a deeper level, what's the subtext? Because there's also a way that we engage with and we interact with art and including with reading. And so the way that we're doing that as we, you know, if we are not engaging in kind of being more open and receptive and a kind of temporary suspension of our own filter and our worldview, why is there insistence on superimposing this kind of subtext, which is so deeply rooted in, right, in, like in anti-Blackness and anti-Black womanness in trying to reduce, I mean, there's a long history, for example, of criminalizing social justice activism and resistance in this country, starting with those who were enslaved escaping were actually tech, technically breaking the law because they were stealing themselves or it fell under, you're stealing stolen property because you literally are classified legally as chattel. So there's also this very long, 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 centuries long history of criminalizing uh, resistance and social justice activism and humans just basically trying to reclaim and live their, their, uh, humanity and dignity. So really the, I would put the question is why the insistence on that interpretation? What is the subtext? And go back to the text and look for the context clues that, that support or don't support that. And then continue to ask five times, well, why? why like, why? Why the insistence on that interpretation? Uh, thank you both for just the, the deep dive that you've done into the play um, and so much of the background. I kid you not, I think I have like 10 to 15 other questions that did not get asked uh, because they really didn't need to be though either with how, how deep you went in uh, to this, this narrative and really just uncovering how rich this story really is. So to close us out, um, you both came to this play and uh, and your shared wisdom about the depths and the breadths of this play through that important lens of uh, Black feminist or womanist critique. Um, just to close out the conversation, can you tell us why it is so important for this voice, for your voices to be at the table with a play like this? And why is it so important for Black voices to be at the table and invited to the fullness of the meal, um, not just the crumbs, when it, it comes to conversations and artistic representations of our stories and our lives as lived in a colonized culture of crumbs? Kara, this is the question you want to end on. <laughs> this thing is so complex. Um, let me start with the bottom half of that question. I think in this country and, and really in, in all countries where Black bodies touch the soil, um, there is a lack of authentic and studied, um, dedicated study to the experiences of Black bodies because we were the linchpin in an economic system, right? And so if all we are known of as, as producers of something or builders of things, the, uh, the economic linchpin, if you will, in, especially in this society um, of wealth generation as a labor force, there aren't even like when we go back and look at primary documents, there aren't even like quality, authentic, realistic, truthful social studies done about 
our humanity. And so because that has persisted this long to this day, we're still like downplaying some of these notions of no, we don't have long bones and that's why we're really good at sports. Um, we're still downplaying some of these pieces. No, we don't speak white. We actually speak in the dialect of the region that we were born in. Yes, AAVE is a complex language unto itself because we don't have these experiences and we don't have, um, we don't have, um, we are not studied as we would Sophocles or Aristotle in a colonized society, it is important for us to always have a voice at the table, always, because we are often misinterpreted in everyday interaction. Elijah McLean, Brianna Taylor, <laughs> Eric Garner, Erica Garner, people who are living their lives and those lives get misread and misinterpreted and now they are buried and we say their names constantly as a reminder. If we don't have a seat at the table, the narratives about the welfare queen and the crack mother and um, the angry black woman persist, the brute persist. Um, black folks really are good. They really are good at sports. Um, too bad there's a, uh, an education gap, an achievement gap, if we don't sit at the table, if we do not tell our own stories, um, Chebe Echinua said it this way, like until the lion has their own historians, history will always privilege, not just history, but the definition of our lives will always privilege those who are the definition makers. Why it's important that I sit at the table is that even though we we say this with black feminist womanist critique, not all black women are the same. My experience is not the same as my good sis Dr. Rofe's. It's not. I didn't grow up in the South. I had a mother who grew up in the South. I grew up in the Southwest, and pff, honey, that <laughs> that in and of itself is a whole nother experience. My first language was like a a Spanglish because I had to be able to play with the people in my neighborhood. The first time I was around Black folks was when I went to North Carolina for the first time and they thought I sounded funny and they were constantly having me say chicken. So even though we're using <laughs> this lens of Black feminism, how I live and walk out and define my Black womanhood is not going to be the same as anyone on this call. And so it becomes really, really important that we even see the differences and the nuances in Black womanhood because, you know, while we are all on the same team, that, that experience is very specific, um, depending on regionality, <laughs> family structure, um, generations, uh, you know, phenotypic expression. Um, so that's what I would say. Dr. Rowe. Woo, thank you. And I, I love it because I can just uh, get real homegrown, my down home as they were saying and so in the, in the play. Really, here are the choices. And, uh, uh, you know, taking from Hannah Nicole Jones, the 1619 Project, that was from the New York Times special issue that's now was published as a book a few months ago with the essays. Black people have always been the heart and soul of this country. The only reason why we've ever had any semblance of a democracy or anything approaching equity in any area is because Black people, and not alone in isolation, but overwhelmingly Black people over time, have held the feet of the United States fire to what's espoused in the Constitution, to right, what's espoused in the Bill of Rights. And the bottom line is, for us, if we're, if, if we're actually to change, and if we're actually to try to bring this country back from the brink of civil war and the planet, right? Self-annihilation of the whole species and the planet. That means that we have to be at the table, right? As we're all like putting it in this larger context, because it's only ever happened when we are at the table. And while it's the priority is obviously on us, right? And our communities, it's really, it's the whole world is, is, is able to kind of follow in that wake, in that momentum of that. 
And so I want to throw that question back out is like, what, what, are you, what, are, what do you have to lose? If you, if you keep on going down this white supremacy rabbit hole and you will, white supremacy is not just people who are proud boys and people who stormed the Capitol. White supremacy is continuing to gatekeep these spaces. White supremacy is continuing to walk, but to, to talk the talk, but not walk the walk at home is called caulking out of both sides of your neck or your throat are talking out of both sides of your mouth. And ultimately, this whole thing is going to go down in flames if we're not at the table. That's it. Period. Stop, to quote Aunt Lily. Thank you both. Thank you so, so much for this conversation. This has been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for uh, your patience and time. I know we've gone a bit beyond uh, the time that we were slated for, but this was such an important and and beautifully held conversation. So I thank you for uh, bringing that wisdom and that beauty to it and to this table. Um, we thank our audience as always for joining us and for remembering, uh, as we said at the beginning, that when we come, we come with love. Uh, when we correct, we correct from a place of love. Um, when we call for change, we are doing that out of love for this uh, beloved and beautiful community that we are all part of, uh, and that we want to be able to take more than crumbs from that table of joy into the community and into ongoing and continued future conversations. Um, so we thank everyone who joined in tonight. We hope that you will come back and join us again for our next conversation. And as always, until then, we hope that you will go in grace. Thank you. <laughs>